I was amongst the very, very early ones to land on Gallipoli. That's on the 25th of April, of course. And it was a marvelous experience. And when we did actually land, we didn't know quite what we were going to do. We hadn't had any definite instructions that we had to take a certain knoll or a certain position. We just went ashore and we looked for Turks. It was the first time that an Australian force had been abroad as an Australian army with its own officers, as its own unit. Here we were on our own, we were Australians. And that's why Anzac to me is so important and it's important to Australia. We became a nation the day we landed on Gallipoli. Every moment of Gallipoli is very, very vividly in my mind. Although it's a long time ago, I could recall the names of dozens of men, and yet I can meet men in the war veterans' home here, and tomorrow morning you ask me the name and I couldn't tell you. Why did I go? Uh, a certain amount of adventure, probably, and a certain amount of patriotism. I think you've got to realize in 1914, Australia was a very, very small country. I mean, population-wise, we had five million, approximately. And in the first division that went away from here, I think there's a very, very big proportion of the members were English, or if not English, were, were definitely English descent. So there's a very, very close affinity between men in Australia, young men, and Britain. And of course, propaganda, reading the papers, we hated the German, we hated the Kaiser, we'd been taught to hate him. So we were happy to go and have a go. I, I suppose that probably clears it up better than anything else. Go and have a go. Was it a sort of boyish adventure for you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The How spirit of adventure, certainly. With yeah. young people, that is a very big factor. Well, how did you go about actually enlisting? Well, I enlisted, I went down, war was declared on the, uh, the 4th of August, as you probably know, and I had a friend out here with me who was in Oxford with me, and he and I both wanted to go, and we were afraid we wouldn't get into the 1st Division, so we sat on the steps of Victoria Barracks on the night of August the 3rd, all night, in case we wouldn't get in on August the 4th. Now, that's, that's just uh, a side to it, but that's how anxious one was to get into the show. And in the early did, days. How did you take to the military life once you were in? I liked it. I liked service life. Tell me more about your training generally. We camped uh, outside of Brisbane at Anagra, which was a very large camp. And there was the organization to be done, the forming of battalion. And then we sailed, as I say, to Albury. And from there, we went to Egypt. And that's where the really hard training took place. At the time you got to Egypt, the soldiers really yeah. weren't trained for fighting at all. Oh, uh, well, uh, no, no, not in the true sense. Well, we'd had quite a lot of uh, infantry training, slope arms, march, turn right, and that sort of thing. But no actual, oh, we'd, we'd been taught a little bit of bayonet fighting. But we can't say we were trained as soldiers. Was there much well, emphasis put on that, on the bayonet oh aspect yes. of it? Oh, yes. Definitely. I don't think any soldier likes the thought of cold steel. It's a pretty formidable weapon, mind you. Uh, but uh, our main hard training was done in the sands of, uh, of Egypt, at Mina. Now, we were a very, very fit battalion. Division, probably better to say. And I don't think any battalion left Australia as fit as what we were. Now, it was heavy sand all around there. Do you know, we used to do a 20-mile route march over thick sand with full packs and rifle and never turn a hair. We'd go and want to go into Cairo. <laughs> We'd got back and play up a little bit. That's how fit we were. Well, now tell me about the Gallipoli landing. Well, we were taken aboard uh, a British battleship cruiser, matter of fact, and we sailed at night, no smoking, absolute silence, pitch dark night, no moon, and we got within, uh, I suppose, seven or eight hundred yards of shore. We couldn't see the shore at this particular time because it was so dark. 
and we were then put into small boats. But unfortunately, in rowing towards the shore, we drifted a little bit north for a matter of about 300 yards, I should say, which was actually Anzac Cove, became known as Anzac Cove. That was a very, very small beach. If we had attempted to land in the original spot, we would have never have landed because the Turks anticipated us landing there and the whole place was undermined with barbed wire and the boats would never have got through. So we were lucky. Well, what was and, your personal experience? Well, we got within about uh, 10 or 12 yards of the shore when Turks opened fire with machine gun and uh, snipers in particular. They weren't strongly fortified there. They didn't anticipate us landing where they did. But we immediately jumped into the water and waded ashore. And immediately ahead of us were these hills, not mountains. Were you in the first wave of boats going in? Captain Chapman was the first man to put his foot on shore, and I was the second. I was with him at the time. <laughs> in the very leading boat? We were the leading boat that hit the shore. Yes. The 9th and 10th actually did the first landing, although other battalions came out with the 9th and 10th of the first wave of the attack on Gallipoli. So we dumped our packs because we couldn't carry those up these hills and we started to climb these things. Wherever we heard shots coming or we saw a Turk, we went after him. So within a few hours, we were completely disorganized. And at four o'clock that afternoon, I was on a ridge called Walker's Ridge. And Shinak, which is our objective of taking the peninsula, was just below us. I could have walked over and taken the damn thing myself. <laughs> had a few extra men with me. Did you actually come face to face with a Turk? Oh yes, oh yes. Not in vast numbers, they were in small bodies. We'd come across a machine gun nest with possibly five men in it. Uh, the Turk was a marvelous fighter. He wouldn't surrender. A German would in those positions. As soon as we got nearer to him, he'd put his hands up, but not the Turk. He was a marvelous little fighter, a gentleman in every particular form of, of fighting, the Turk. We admired him tremendously and we became very great friends. How can you become friends and admire and call a man a gentleman who's doing his best to kill you? Well, we were doing our best to kill him too, weren't we? It was a war of nations, not of individuals. Well, didn't this individual confrontation take place? Didn't you find yourself face to face with the man you were trying to kill? Not, not with the Turks. We did, we killed thousands of them. Not, not in vast numbers. But you personally? Yeah. Yeah. Did you come as close as you are? To you? Oh, yes. And what happened? How did you feel at that time? I didn't feel anything except that he was an enemy. He wasn't an individual in any shape or form. He was there to protect Gallipoli and we were there to take it. But it must be rather different to actually stick your banner in a person rather than a... Well, we're sticking them in sandbags. It's not much difference in our training. <laughs> it's much the same thing, actually. No, that didn't worry me a little bit. Did the thought and sight of your own friends being killed. Yes, yes. Right at the very start, uh, when I saw uh, Sergeant Lambert killed, who was a very great pal of mine, that did affect me. I knew we were at war. I don't think we realized it until that moment. By, uh, oh, by 12 o'clock, they were dropping all around us. We lost a lot of men in that first day. A lot that you personally knew? Oh, yes, a lot of my own battalion. As I mentioned before, in a battalion, you know every man, there's a thousand odd, and you get to know them all, and they all become personal friends. So you do, you feel it. Later on, particularly uh, when we got to France, we got hardened to it, and we didn't take much notice of it. But that first day, you see mates killed, it had an effect, of course. Well, what was life like in the trenches during the height of during, the campaign? Well, when uh, after the first day and we reorganized and we formed a defense line, then things got terrifically bad. Rations were very poor. We didn't see a piece of bread until the first week in August before we saw bread. We had no cooks at all. Every man in the early days had a piece of uh, a little bag made of unbleached calico into which all his ration went every day, individually. 
There's a slice of bacon, we used to call it a lance corporal if it had a little streak of red through it at all, an ounce of tea, I think there's two ounces of sugar if I remember, two biscuits, hard dog biscuits, uh, uh, a tin of jam between eight and a tin of bully beef between four. Now that was the whole of our rations. So the result was that uh, uh, by August, September, we became very, very weak. The flies were so terrific, you couldn't get a piece of jam onto a biscuit and hope to get it into your mouth without four or five flies going in with it. That's how bad it was. The lice, we were alive with lice, and there was no way of getting rid of them. We had no means of washing, we had no change of gear of any kind, not even an undershirt was changed the whole time we were there. So we were a pretty rotten, dirty mob. In retrospect, was the Gallipoli exercise worthwhile? It wasn't. It was a complete fiasco. It was a failure. Personally? Yes, I wouldn't have missed Gallipoli. It was uh, the start of the war for us. We learnt a lot there. We were probably a lot better soldiers in France, where the fighting was much heavier and harder. But because of our experience in Gallipoli, we were far better soldiers than what we would have been if we had gone straight to France. There's no doubt about that. Let's talk about what happened after you left Gallipoli. What was the evacuation like? The evacuation was probably the only, oh, can the trouble if I say this, the only brilliant thing that was done on Gallipoli. It was a brilliant expedition, no doubt about it. Marvelously conceived and wonderfully carried out. I would like to tell you one little thing about Gallipoli prior to the evacuation. On May the 19th, which incidentally was my birthday, the Turks made a determined attack to push us off. And they came in thousands. Now by this time we were very, very well dug in. We had a marvelous defensive system and we mowed them down in hundreds. Not in ones or twos, but definitely in hundreds. There were so many killed that on the 24th of May, which was five days afterwards, they asked for a 24-hour armistice. This will throw a little bit of light onto the attitude of an Australian to a Turk, I think, in a moment. And the 24 hours armistice was granted to Turks to enable them to bury their dead. Uh, in that regard, by this time, the heat was terrific. And the thing, was the worst thing that we had to encounter on Gallipoli were the flies. There were millions. And the stench from the dead bodies, no one can appreciate or realize what it was like. So we were very, very thankful that they got their 24 hour armistice. And we formed a line, we had an Australian and six feet from him was a Turk. And that went right along the line. My boys came back dressed as Turks and the Turks went back dressed as Australian because they'd swapped their uniforms. Our boys had given the Turks what cigarettes they had and the Turks had given our boys what cigarettes they had. So they came back almost like Turks. So that, that gives you a little appreciation, the feeling, the personal feeling that was between an Australian and a Turk. It was a... Do you think, uh, with that sort of feeling, that the war could really be justified? Did you feel any... You obviously didn't feel personal animosity towards this. Can war be justified? I'm afraid not. I think war is a shocking thing. But, I mean, if you read history, go back to the beginning of the Bible. You've had wars. You've had continuous wars. And you'll never get away from war. Do you, think it, it, uh, do you think it solves anything, though? War? No, it doesn't. Does the it strange ever... thing about the uh, war, and this, this is particularly applicable to the last war, the only winners were the losers. But I think it's the duty of every man to defend his own country. You'll defend your own home, why not your own country? The country has done a lot for every man. We're happy to be in Australia. I'm proud to be in Australia. And whilst I'd be able to do it, I'd be prepared to defend it. I think Anzac Day is marvelous. 
The great feature of Anzac Day, in my opinion, is the meeting of old comrades. I think 99% of return men who go into the march go there to meet friends. Now, in my particular case, being a Queenslander, not once in 12 months would I meet an ex 9th Battalion man. If I go into the march, I'm sure to meet one or two. Okay. Now, that to me is worthwhile. Just to renew acquaintance, have a good laugh, have a beer if necessary. I, I don't like the idea of the men going into the march and then getting frightfully full. I think a few beers are all right. 